What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week. We challenge the recent U.S. military report that downplayed the radiation impact of the USS Ronald Reagan Operation Tomodachi sailors with a report of our own. First, we talk again with Steve Simmons, a 17-year veteran of the Navy who was on board the Reagan, got hit with the radiation plume, and was first interviewed on nuclear hot seat number 159 three weeks ago. He gives us his analysis of the report. As well as a very personal response. Then, epidemiologist Joseph Mangano, executive director of Radiation and Public Health Project, walks us through what's wrong with the military's report, and creates a context so that we can understand exactly what's going on. More powerful information in advance of the August 19 hearing in San Diego Federal Court. Where Tokyo Electric Power Company is attempting to get the lawsuit by USS Reagan sailors thrown out. Those interviews, plus numbnuts of the week, a Ma Nature Elephant in the Living Room report, and a bit of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doc and cover report, will be coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, July twenty nine, twenty fourteen, and here is the week's anti nuclear news. At Fukushima Daiichi in Japan, Tokyo Electric Power Company's plans to build an ice wall to stem the flow of radioactive water from the damaged nuclear reactors is less a set of popsicles than a slushy. That's because the darn thing refuses to freeze. In the three months since construction of this debacle began. Temperatures in the ground around the barrier, meant to contain the contaminated water in underground trenches, have only fallen to about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So TEPCO is planning to dump 10 tons of ice every day until the wall forms. What the geniuses at TEPCO haven't taken into account, it seems, is that salt water. Has to be colder than regular water in order to freeze. It's 32 degrees for fresh water, but 28.4 degrees Fahrenheit for ice water. So, what a bunch of fresh water ice cubes are going to do is anybody's guess. Even if this harebrained scheme does succeed in freezing the water, there is a possibility that the retained contaminated water may overflow the ice barrier. At the Japanese Ministry of the Environment expert meeting discussing health support after the Fukushima nuclear accident held on July 16, an outside researcher had the nerve, the nerve, to ask for expansion of health checkups. To which the committee chair responded, "I don't want to discuss the issue." Invited guest speaker Toshihide Tsuda, an epidemiologist and Okayama University professor, said. Radioactive materials being disseminated due to the Fukushima nuclear accident are not thought to remain within the borders of Fukushima Prefecture. We need to urgently figure out if there are any cases in non-Fukushima residents. Despite having invited Professor Tsuda to the meeting, Chairman Shigenobu Nagataki said, "I have no intention of arguing with you," and cut off the conversation. Tomotaka Subue. A member of the expert meeting and a professor at Osaka University was allowed to speak, and he explained the disadvantages of health checkups using the term overdiagnosis, and said that this means discovery of cancer during health checkups could cause excessive anxiety and a psychological and physical burden due to surgery. 
This example of the nuclear insanity in Japan comes despite requests for expansion of health checkups from local residents. In another example of Japanese nuclear, what are you thinking? Residents within five kilometers, that's three miles, of the Sendai nuclear power plant in Kagoshima were given potassium iodide tablets to keep on hand in case there is an accident at the plant. Doesn't that just instill confidence? But NHK reports that residents are only being given two tablets each. One is needed per day per person. And two days may not be enough time to get residents to safety, depending on traffic, road conditions, wind speed, direction of plume, and the size of the release. And of course, the residents who receive them have not been told that it can only protect the thyroid from iodine-131 uptake, but not protect them from radiation in general. If we could talk to the animals, they'd be really ticked off about the radiation from Fukushima. So instead, let's just hear from... I'm Mother Nature. Don't mess with me. Sorry, Mom, but it looks like we already have. Wild monkeys in the Fukushima region of Japan have blood abnormalities linked to the radioactive fallout from the 2011 nuclear power plant disaster. Professor Shinichi Hayama at the Nippon Veterinary and Life Science University in Tokyo told The Guardian, This first data from non-human primates, the closest relatives of humans, should make a notable contribution to future research on the health effects of radiation exposure in humans. They showed cesium in the muscles of up to 1,778 becquerels per kilogram, too high to even eat here in the United States and significantly low white and red blood cell counts, hemoglobin, and hemocrit. In the Pacific Northwest of North America, once common marine birds are disappearing. Their numbers have plummeted dramatically in recent decades, and several new studies now link many dwindling marine bird populations to what they eat, especially herring, anchovies, and sand lance, which are at a fraction of what they once were. Since 1970, Puget Sound's biggest herring stock has crashed with more than 90% of the population all but gone. One researcher said, something's happening on a big level, but what is it? How can he miss that Fukushima-sized elephant in the living room? The population of Alaska's largest caribou herd is down about 27% since 2011. While calf production is up, the calf survival rate is going down and mortality rates for adults, especially cows, has increased. Starfish continue to die by the millions up and down the Pacific coast. Over 20 species have been affected. And no word if it's related to radiation risks or not, but the Mexican government has banned the capture of bluefin tuna in Mexican waters for the remainder of the 2014 calendar year. Radiation from Fukushima was found in samples of bluefin tuna caught off the coast of California as early as May of 2012. So when it comes to radiation, you can lie to the people, but you can't fool Mother Nature. Don't mess with me! How's this for your tax dollars at work? A congressionally mandated report from the National Academy of Sciences was published on Thursday, July 24th, and it said that the overarching lesson learned from the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi accident is that nuclear plant licensees and their regulators, quote, must actively seek out and act upon, end quote, new information about hazards with the potential to affect the safety of nuclear plants. You think? This little bit of wisdom came from a committee of 21 specialists who gathered information over two years for the report, which was sponsored by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Among the profound recommendations, improving the availability, reliability, redundancy, and diversity of specific nuclear plant systems, improving operator training, strengthening capabilities for assessing risks, The NRC should incorporate modern risk concepts into its nuclear safety regulations and that the industry must continuously monitor and maintain a strong safety culture. Wow! 
Who could have predicted such insights? It's NRC Duck <laughs> and cover report time. As predicted on last week's nuclear hot seat, the Turkey Point Unit's three and four nuclear reactors in Miami-Dade, Florida, experienced cooling waters that exceeded the limit of 100 degrees Fahrenheit. At which point the plants are supposed to be shut down. The NRC, of course, allowed them to exceed that 100 degree temperature up to 103 degrees Fahrenheit because the increase in temperature was due to a natural event, otherwise known as summer. Turkey Point exceeded the temperature on July 20th, July 26th, the 27th, and the 28th, each time for five hours or more. But hey, perception is everything, and if the NRC changes its levels and says it's going to be okay now, it is okay now. At least that's what they've convinced people to believe. <laughs> Meanwhile, there was heat of an entirely different kind at the Braidwood nuclear power plant in Illinois. When 14 gunshots were heard inside the owner-controlled area, local law enforcement was contacted and investigated. <laughs> and in case you haven't had enough special reports, it's time for nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, num num sound awake. At Malmstrom Air Force Base in Great Falls, Montana. Young officers must keep 150 nuclear-tipped missiles ready to launch at a moment's notice. Three times a month, they're tested on the weapons and the codes used to launch them. Anything less than 90 percent is a failure. So officers have learned how to pass that test the new, old-fashioned way. They cheat by texting each other the answers on tests. This was revealed in January of this year, and the Air Force responded by changing the way it grades. From here on out, all tests are pass/fail, and individual scores are not recorded. This for a nuclear arsenal large enough to cause nuclear winter for the planet. Can self-esteem classes be far behind? And that's why the Air Force is this week's. Nuclear hot seat, num num sound awake. One final news item: South Africa has confirmed its commitment to nuclear power by allocating 81 million dollars, over 10 percent of its energy ministry's budget, to research and development of nukes. Speaking for the Southern Hemisphere, there goes the neighborhood. The antidote to all of this nuclear num nutsery is my e-book. Yes, I glow in the dark. One mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. What does it mean to find yourself only one mile away from a nuclear accident just as it's happening? Learn all the harrowing details. It's available as an ebook on Amazon Kindle for about the same as the cost of a cup of coffee. You didn't need that coffee anyway. Get the ebook. It's a good read, and it helps supports me to be able to continue this work. Now. For this week's featured interviews, we wanted to know what a sailor from the USS Ronald Reagan thought about the recently released military report that said, in so many words, that radiation from Fukushima was no big deal, and that it could not possibly have been responsible for the catastrophic illnesses being experienced by more than 100 plaintiffs in a lawsuit against Tokyo Electric Power Company (TEPCO). We turned first to Steve Simmons, a 17-year veteran of the Navy who was on the Reagan, has joined the lawsuit, and who we first interviewed on Nuclear Hot Seat Number 159 three weeks ago. Steve gives us his personal take on and response to this report. Be clear that when he refers to Paul and Charles, he means Paul Gardner and Charles Bonner, the attorneys leading the case for the sailors. Steve. What was your response when you learned of the report issued to Congress that says radiation levels that hit the USS Reagan were too low to have caused the kinds of illnesses that you and the other sailors are suffering from? When I first read the report, it didn't surprise me、uh, with the information that they had submitted. But at the same time, it doesn't really—I don't want to say they didn't put a lot of—they didn't put effort into it. But they took the information that was already published. They took the information from the Tomodachi Registry, which 
nobody really that I've talked to actually agrees with to begin with. They come up with these numbers of they have a group of sailors who was supposedly that they use a number of those who were on active duty as of May 12, 2011, and that number is 4,843. And they take that and they go out and get a control group to compare that to, and their control group is 65,269. For me, that was the first issue that I had with it, aside from the introductory letters from the different offices of, let's see, I think it was Secretary of Defense and all that stuff, all the different OSD offices. You know, I, you know, it just kind of, I don't want to say hurts, but it's more frustrating in, to see that they're not even going to use a control population that is equivalent to what they're trying to compare to. If I have a specific population that I'm studying, 4,843, and I want to find out the effects on that population due to natural disaster or environmental factors or whatever, I need to have a control population of relatively the same number. Give or take a few hundred, okay, understand that. But when you're taking a control group of over 65,000, you're going to have higher numbers out of a higher population than you would if you have a small population. That was one of the first issues that I had with the report. The second issue that I had with the report, they talk about following detection of airborne radioactivity that the Ronald Reagan moved north of 40 degrees latitude over 120 nautical miles north of Fukushima Daiichi to avoid further contact with radioactivity from Fukushima. And we entered the nuclear plume, I think it was around 37 degrees north latitude is where we entered this nuclear plume. And we were in this nuclear plume for over five hours. And when you look at the Tomodachi Registry website, and it has their map of where Fukushima is at and where different forces were operating, whether shore-based or out to sea, and their little icon for the fleet operating shows that the fleet was operating, according to the map, southeast of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Granted, it could be just an indicator icon that says, okay, the fleet's out here in the Pacific Ocean. But for in a case like this, if they're trying to break down numbers and come up with an estimate of what everybody's been exposed to, I would assume, and that could be my fault by actually making an assumption, that they should indicate a very good proximity. If somebody looks at a map, just a quick glance at a map, they can say, okay, this is where all our bases were in, in proximity to Fukushima, and this is where our fleet is operating without having to try to go digging for that information because not everybody is going to have access to the ship's deck log to see at what latitude and longitude did they enter a nuclear plume or any case like that. Another issue I have with the report, obviously they're using the registry's data saying that the Ronald Reagan was exposed to such low amounts of radiation, nothing that would be more harmful than background radiation or from a transcontinental flight or anything like that. Yet we had individuals who have gone on record now who indicated that they were picking up radiation levels 30 times higher while we were out to sea than what was actually reported by TEPCO. Since then, I had also talked to an individual who, the first time I talked to him, I had no idea who he was. I had no idea that he had been on the Reagan and actually worked in the reactor department on the Reagan. And he was telling me that they were picking up radiation levels well before anybody had ever said anything about it, that they were picking up, they were detecting radiation in the atmosphere that was not coming from the Reagan's reactors which I also found was interesting, that here they are, because they're the, they are the ones with the sensitive equipment who are supposed to pick up this information, and yet none of that information was made public to anybody. One of the other frustrating pieces with this report is they talk about the radiation contaminants in the water system. And in this report, it talks about how that was actually erroneous, 
that there was no detection, there was no contaminants in the water. And all through this report, they talk about how sensitive this equipment is and how high-tech this equipment is that they're using to make these detections, whether uh, in the atmosphere, whether it's in potable water, at the water fountains, whatever. But yet then they come back and later on saying how it was erroneous and it was actually a mistake because what they were picking up was background radiation and not radiation that was actually in the water. So to me, that's kind of a contradiction. You're going to tell me that your equipment is so high-tech and so sensitive that for me you should be able to distinguish if you're picking up background radiation out of the air or if you're doing a specific test on drinking water to indicate whether there is contaminants in the water and not just the atmosphere. They're completely throwing out the idea that there is any contaminants in the water at all. And in fact, aside from saying that it was erroneous, they also say that they brought in an outside organization after the fact, and they also supposedly did testing. Steve went on to read extensively from the report about the potable water testing. The gist of it is that three water samples taken from two water fountains and a potable water tank were initially tested on March 15, 2011, with what was called in the report, quote, sensitive radiation detection equipment, end quote. This indicated the presence of low levels of radioactivity. Then the sample from the potable water tank was reanalyzed with the same, quote, unquote, sensitive equipment and found to not have any radioactivity, and none of the other samples were ever found to be radioactive. The exact wording is read by Steve. The samples taken on March 15, 2011 were erroneously reported as containing detectable radioactivity due to fluctuations in background radiation that affect the sample counts. End quote. How does what they're saying in this official report differ from your own experience and knowledge of what was going on with the water in those first few days? You know, if I recall correctly, at no point did they ever come out and say that it it was erroneously reported because there's supposed to be measures in place to prevent things from being reported erroneously. That's why you have a checks and balance system. And if you're checking potable water or you're checking a tank or whatever the case might be, you should have measures in place where those tests, are not going to be affected, the results of that test, I should say, are not going to be affected by background radiation because you should be, if you're testing water, you should be able to distinguish the difference between what you're picking up in the water and what you're picking up from background radiation. So that was one thing for me. Uh, And then, of course, it goes on to say they requested the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory perform an independent technical review of potable water sample analysis, and then it says that they were... The team of highly qualified KAPL, which is the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory engineers and scientists, including two certified health physicists, experts in radiation measurement and radiation dose assessment, a Ph.D. in statistics and a Ph.D. in radiochemistry, and two experts in radiation health and radiological engineering reviewed the Reagan's potable water data. And then it says that those experts concluded the potable water sample results initially reported as containing detectable radioactivity were not indicative of a radiologically contaminated potable water system. And then, of course, they throw in their extra paragraph after that. However, for perspective, even if erroneous potable water radioactivity measurements discussed above were correct, the exposure to personnel aboard the Ronald Reagan would be extremely small. (laughs) And at what point do you say the ingestion of any radioactivity in water, aside from your normal background radiation, because we all know that there's some background radiation from the sun and everything else, or your microwave, or anything like that. But aside from that, especially if we're picking up levels already admitted to 30 times higher than what Tokyo Electric had reported, at what point can you say that's safe to drink and that there's no harm? to any of the sailors on board. It honestly feels that they're going through extreme measure to cover cover up this incident or to 
get the public to buy into the rhetoric that there's absolutely nothing wrong, inundate them with information, inundate them with a bunch of junk, and throw out a bunch of big titles and try to get them to believe what they want them to believe, that over 100 sailors, well over 100 sailors, including one dead, is making this up, that they're all fine. I don't get it. I, I, I have a hard time... I honestly have a hard time wrapping my head around this one to figure out why they would go to such great lengths to even entertain the fact that we already know TEPCO lied. It's already been proven that TEPCO lied. So why is it so difficult to go back and if they have to readjust figures based on the data that they have or the right data and say, okay, we're sorry, there is going to be a potential for health problems, considering this is, the, if I'm not mistaken, the worst nuclear disaster I mean, it's already been deemed worse than Chernobyl. So I'm trying to figure out how can this be the worst nuclear disaster with no threat to human life? I guess that's the hard part for me. What I'm struck by, just as a writer who's aware of the use of language and the flow of information, is that they go to great lengths to say, no, nah, there was no radiation, there was no radiation. Every time they mention the equipment, it is how sensitive it is. They always use it. They go back to how sensitive it is, like they're justifying it. And they say, you know, there was none, there was none. And then they go, but in case there was, it really couldn't have made. The it's like they're trying to cover their bases, but the argument to me sounds weak. Do you have any thought at all? as to why the government would put out a report that comes down so heavily against you and the other USS Reagan United States military personnel, especially when we are in such close proximity to the federal court hearing in San Diego where TEPCO is seeking to dismiss the suit. I wish I knew why they would put out such a report. I wish I could figure out what their reasoning is behind it for them trying to dismiss this as a cause for so many health problems, especially, you know, one of the pieces that I struggle with. When you look at these ailments that are striking individuals and all these folks that are now dealing with failing health, you're not looking at a population of individuals who are 40, 50, 60, 70, or 80 years old. You're looking at a population that the average age is probably maybe in their upper 20s, at best, young 30s. And you are how old? I am 36. And all of this started for me more than three years ago. I was 33 years old at the time that this started with my health. So that young to mid-30 range, you know, people are dealing with ailments that are not common in a young populace and yet they still want to discredit it. They still want to... These reports are coming from, you know, when I read the letterhead on the, this report, you've got the Assistant Secretary of Defense, another individual from the Assistant Secretary of Defense, and I just, you know, keep asking myself, at what point are they going to actually talk to an individual or an organization who's not on the government payroll, who does not have a vested interest in whether the government or national relations between another nation doesn't get egg on its face, but is willing to step up and do what's right for the people, for those who had sacrificed, for those who have put themselves out there voluntarily and said, I'm willing to go fight in any way possible for my country and for our allies, whether it's in combat or to assist during humanitarian efforts. But yet when something goes wrong, 
something happens, we're so quick to turn the other direction and forget about it and, you know, immediately try to dismiss the idea, the thought that was potentially harmful to your greatest asset ever, your greatest military asset being your sailors, your Marines, the people, but they're more concerned about politics and public opinion, public view. And I think that's the part that hurts the most. Nobody is trying to sit here and say that the government screwed up, that it's all the government's fault or it's all the Navy's fault or anything like that. Nobody to this point, to my knowledge, has ever come out and said that. I've made that clear. Paul and Charles have made that clear. And we've also made it clear that the onus of this belongs to TEPCO because of the information that they provided initially, which led the Navy into a false sense of security. That information was false. And with all the public and private knowledge now of that being false, that's the piece I struggle with of why it's so hard for them to say mistakes were made whether they apologize or not, you know, that's apples and oranges. I don't care if they come out and say we're sorry because, honestly, saying I'm sorry is just words. It doesn't necessarily mean anything because it's so overused. But when you say mistakes were made and this is what we're going to do to take care of those people who have now been affected that's what's going to speak volumes. That's what's going to make the difference. The words are, they're not going to mean anything. But the actions are what's going to speak volumes. Or in this case, the inactions and the continue discredit, cover up, and try to convince all these sailors and Marines that they're the crazy ones, that nothing's wrong with them. That's the problem. To get a more scientific read on the military's report on Fukushima radiation and its impact on the USS Reagan sailors, I spoke with Joseph Mangano, an epidemiologist and executive director of the Radiation and Public Health Project Research Group. I began by reviewing the statistics used by the military report to set up their analysis. As an epidemiologist, give us a sense as to how well or how poorly this comparison was set up. First of all, there are 112 sailors, one of whom has since died, who are part of the lawsuit against TEPCO because of their severe illnesses. At the time of Operation Tomodachi, there were 4,843 sailors on the Reagan, and the control group, meaning the members of the Operation Tomodachi registry, which did not contain any of the sailors, from the Reagan, numbered 65,269. That was what was compared with the just under 5,000 sailors on the Reagan. What's right or wrong about this means of comparison? Well, it's a little odd because usually in a comparison like this, it's one-to-one. In other words, they would compare 4,800 sailors on the Reagan versus 4,800 other sailors, or sometimes one-to-two or maybe a little more. This is like 1 to 16, which, which is a bit of overkill. Still, uh, e- even with that, we would expect the report to find something unusual. Not speaking scientifically, but just uh, in plain English. We're talking about 4,800-some-odd sailors. These are mostly people in their 20s and 30s. They're ve- very physically fit. You know, they, they certainly all were qualified for military service. And the idea that in three years, 112 of them are sick with a variety of illnesses just does not jive with any sort of scientific understanding of such an otherwise healthy group. Yes, certainly young people get sick, but, but not this, this number. And there are actually, when I say 112, these are the 112 sailors who have actually filed suit. Both the attorneys for the, the sick sailors and even in, in the Defense Department reports say there are more. Attorneys say it's uh, maybe around 500 or more, and the Defense Department report even suggests that 
around a thousand are sick with one illness or another. R- right then and there, common sense says that there's something wrong here in, in such a short period of time with such young, healthy people that, that so many are, are suffering from illnesses. Even though the method used wasn't exactly wrong, certainly the conclusion should raise a lot of eyebrows that, the, that radiation didn't harm these people. We learned that in the Operation Tomodachi Registry, not one of the sailors who are part of the lawsuit, who are the ones we're in contact with, was asked to fill out any kind of paperwork or be part of the registry. How appropriate is that in terms of coming up with an overall compilation of the impact of the radiation on this group of people? Well, hopefully the... Defense Department had uh, medical records of these sailors at their disposal. I mean, yes, if you wanted to do a, a very good study, you would contact all of them and get a thorough health history and history of what happened when they sailed towards Fukushima and, and what happened afterwards. That is the best. And if you're going to do, you know, for something such as serious as this, that's what should have been done. But otherwise, they should have had access to health records, to medical records for all these people. And I don't know if that was the case or not. They're saying that the doses of radiation that were received by the sailors were, quote, very small and well below levels associated with adverse medical conditions. How accurate is that for you? Well, that, that I think, is the big one here. Doses are too low. First of all, that is a falsehood. Every dose of radiation harms people, no matter how low, no matter how high. This is not my opinion. It is the conclusion based on hundreds and hundreds of scientific studies of eminent researchers that have found that even low doses cause harm, especially in in vulnerable groups such as infants and elderly people. Secondly, that statement usually is a result of (laughs) taking the doses from other types of radiation. There's different types of radiation, usually x-rays, and extrapolating them, you know, translating them down to the amounts they received while at sea. The radiation that came out of Fukushima that these sailors were exposed to is a special kind. Not that any radiation is good. No, it's all harmful. But these radioactive chemicals and nuclear reactors produce more than a hundred of them. They're not found in nature. They are especially harmful. They're the same bunch of a hundred or more chemicals that are released when an atomic bomb explodes, okay? They didn't occur. They they, they didn't didn't exist in nature before 1945. The first time we, we found them was when The bombs were exploded in Japan in World War II at at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And they have a different journey, a different (laughs) route uh, into the body than, say, X-rays. X-rays, you you take a picture of someone, and this ray just zings right through your body. Yes, it does harm people, but it goes right through. The radiation that the sailors absorbed were breathed and even drank and eaten in water and food that had become contaminated. And these chemicals go right into your body. It's called an internal exposure, whereas an X-ray is more of an external exposure. We're talking apples and oranges here. You can't compare the two. So the whole Defense Department reports, which was based on other types of radiation, really is not backed up by science. What's the biggest misconception people have when they hear the term low-level radiation? Well, throughout the atomic era, and I'm talking about the last 70 years, there was an assumption that low doses didn't harm you. Okay, yes, we understand that being near the atomic bomb harmed people. Uh, It was just this assumption that relatively low doses wouldn't do anything for you. And certainly government leaders hung on to this assumption, but they were found to be wrong numerous times, and I'll give three examples. One was... Years ago, doctors used to give pregnant women x-rays to the abdomen just to diagnose, to see how big the child was and where the child's head was. A 
study came out in, in 1956 showing it doubled the chance the child would die of cancer by age 10. The leaders went wild. No, it can't be. It's impossible. Several other studies were done. They found the same thing, and no more x-rays are done to the abdomens of pregnant women. Number two was the atomic bomb test fall. Years ago in the 50s and 60s, the atomic bombs were tested above the ground in Nevada. Although people were very upset about it and President Kennedy banned these above-ground tests, the government continued to maintain that the fallout, which went all the way across the country, didn't harm anybody. Finally, in 1999, a National Academy of Sciences study estimated that up to 212,000 Americans developed just thyroid cancer alone from these tests. The third one I'll give you is workers, you know, workers in nuclear plants that made weapons. For years, the government said, yes, we're monitoring their doses, and these doses are low, and they are not at any harm for any disease. Finally, in the year 2000, the Energy Department, the United States Energy Department, put out a report listing several dozen studies that concluded that workers were at extra risk for a number of cancers, and that led the Congress to pass a, a bill compensating workers that happened to get sick. So again, we have this pattern of low dose, let's assume it's harmless, let's deny, but later on, oops, you know what, we've done studies and we found that this is incorrect. The same thing is going to happen with the sailors on the USS Reagan, I'm sure. Joe, what is important for people to understand when they hear about this report and see the numbers? The important things to remember, first of all, we're not talking about a small leak here. We're talking about the Fukushima meltdown. It was a catastrophic, massive meltdown, all right? Along with Chernobyl, the two worst nuclear disasters in history. So these were not small doses, as they put it. Number two, the fact that these you know, very physically fit people have come down with, a lot of them have come down with illnesses should be quite disturbing. An illness within three years in your 20s and 30s when you're very healthy, and many of them are, are cancers and other immune disorders, is a very rare thing. Yeah, it happens on, on great occasion, but very rarely. Here we have 112 that went through with the lawsuit and probably hundreds of others that did not. So right there, there should be a disturbance. And, and for the Defense Department to just say, no, it isn't the radiation, well, did they propose any other possible reasons? And did they look at any other potential factors? I don't believe they did. And I think there should be an independent review of this study and independent studies by someone other than essentially the employer of the sailors. That was epidemiologist Joseph Mangano, Executive Director of Radiation and Public Health Project. Keeping Joe's comments in mind, listen again to Steve Simmons of the USS Reagan to gain some perspective on how his current medical team deals with the Tomodachi radiation issue. I had another appointment with neurology today. The neurologist, of course, is completely stumped. And, of course, she's, through her exam, well, I should say through two neurologist exams, they both agree that there is definitely something upper motor neuron going on here, but they're just not sure what it is or what caused it. And I brought up the radiation exposure because I bring that up at every appointment as this could be your potential catalyst of what triggered all of this, being that I was in good health prior to this. And I told her, there's this radiation exposure during Operation Tomodachi and it seems as nobody wants to touch this thing with a 10-foot pole. And the comment I got back was, well, nobody wants to touch it with a 10-foot pole because we want to find something, we want to continue to look for something we can treat. And there's so much about radiation that we just don't understand. I'm glad she's being honest, but at the same time, at what point are people going to start to realize that this did have an effect on people and start opening their eyes to say we can't put our finger on an etiology of all these issues that these young individuals are suffering from 
what was the one thing in common amongst every single one of them. And that common factor that you're going to find is participation in Operation Tomodachi. I don't think that's a coincidence. Is there anything we can do about this report or anything that we should be doing about this in the outside community that will be helpful or supportive to you and the other sailors? I guess the biggest piece or the biggest thing I could say that would probably be the biggest help to anybody, the sailors and Marines and even the airmen, because they're going to pop up, uh, whether they have our already or not, the airmen that were even on ground there in Japan, you know, the biggest thing to, to support them is not be so quick to buy into this stuff that just because it's coming from an official source, they put out this document, this official document, saying that there's absolutely no health risk. Look at the facts. Look at the picture. You know, like I mentioned, look at what the common factor was among all these individuals who are now suffering from ailments. And when you break that down, you're going to see that the common thing is Operation Tomodachi. And if enough people contact their congressmen or public officials and keep pressing the issue and say, look, we're not going to buy into this, we're not going to believe this, the government has a trend of this. Back in Vietnam, Agent Orange wasn't an issue. Early on with the Gulf War and even after 2001, back in Iraq again, the burn pits of Iraq were not an issue. And now they're quickly realizing how much the burn pits are an issue and have affected individuals' health that serve boots on ground in Iraq. So there is a history here. There is a history of discrediting potential health hazards that happened through different forms of global operations, whether armed conflict or humanitarian, and it needs to stop. At some point, if a mistake was done, it's time to admit the mistake was done. And I think if enough people continue to push the issue, continue to show the support, and especially show the support to Paul and Charles and their team who are taking this in front of the federal court in San Diego coming up in August and get involved, that hopefully justice will come out of this. And when I say justice comes out of this, I'm talking about this doesn't go away and the people who are suffering, the young sailors, the young Marines who are suffering, and their families who are suffering are taken care of properly. Um, like I mentioned in my first interview, you know, there's so many of them, so many young sailors and Marines uh, who have been already separated from military service. Their career is cut short because of no fault to theirs, and they're out of the service with no pension, uh, no benefits, no medical insurance for them or their families if they're married. That's not taking care of those who sign on the dotted line to sacrifice anything and everything for their country. You know, they sign a blank check, you know, including their life for this country if need be. And that's not taking care of them. Those are the individuals that need to be taken care of. That was Steve Simmons, formerly of the USS Ronald Reagan, and one of the sailors represented by the lawsuit against TEPCO. The hearing he referred to is scheduled for San Diego Federal Court on Tuesday, August 19, 2014. And I'll have more to say about it during today's Final Thought. You know, Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your support to keep bringing you the anti-nuclear news every week. Donations are needed to cover bandwidth charges, website security, travel expenses to cover stories like the one in San Diego, web hosting, and so much more. If you've not yet donated, or if you have already and would like to help out again, just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the homepage, and click on the big red Donate button. Your assistance will go directly to helping me help you keep up to date on all things anti-nuclear. Activist shout-outs. Last week's Numb Nuts of the Week was based on a story from Yori Mochizuki's wonderful blog, Fukushima Diary. 
where he reported about Fukushima City putting together a program called Let's Build Radiation Resistance Body. This was for children. They said, don't worry too much, go to bed early, open a window. Iori busted them on the story, and I picked it up, and others did as well, and son of a gun. Fukushima City government updated their website after the story broke in Fukushima Diary, and ta-da, they took it out with an apology. Well done, Iori. The Environmental Protection Agency is still, until August 3rd, asking for our input on whether or not they should relax their rules restricting radiation emissions from nuclear reactors and other nuclear facilities. Reportedly, they're thinking of doing this by as much as a factor of 350. Doesn't change the science, just changes the perception. And that's what's so dangerous because people then go way back to sleep. So go to the EPA and leave your comments. We will have a link to their site up on our site, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog under episode number 162. And Gene Stone of Residents Organized for Safe Environment has asked that we write to support the NRC's embattled chair. Why are the chairs always the good guys and are they always embattled? But they are. Anyway, to support Commissioner Allison McFarlane in asking that the NRC open an old dry storage cask which contains fuel rods with high burn-up fuel, the more dangerous fuel inside of them, because this has never been tested. This opening of a cask would be to check on the condition of this highly dangerous fuel and what impact it has had on the condition of the cask. A little less oak, maybe not a particularly good vintage, but we've got to find out before Southern California Edison tries to fob off on us the cheapest possible casks, which we will just have to replace in 20 years or less. Calling John Stewart. Hey, John, did you see John Oliver's slam dunk on nuclear weapons the other night? Here's your chance to keep up with your former protege. Do a segment, a big, hairy segment, on the numb nutsery of the commercial nuclear industry. Don't know where to look to find the funny bone of this issue? I do. Call me. Or send me your number and I'll call you. Or I'll call your producers. Or your mother. That actually might be the most effective. But just watch out, or I will be calling John Oliver. Here's today's final thought. The upcoming hearing on the lawsuit by the USS Reagan sailors against Tokyo Electric Power Company to gain compensation for their current medical expenses as well as the expenses that will inevitably be coming up for additional sailors and Marines is, without exaggeration, one of the most important legal cases on this planet. It will serve as the equivalent of a referendum on the health impact of exposure to radiation. The catastrophic health breakdowns of the USS Reagan Operation Tomodachi sailors is happening so quickly, so visibly, and so dramatically that there is a real chance here to prove that radiation exposure does lead to devastating health damage. The odds are that we will never again have such a clear case of nuclear radiation cause and effect. That's why Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, and its allies are rallying and using everything they've got with their bottomless PR budgets, political connections, and trade agreements to get this case knocked down and out. If the anti-nuclear forces, meaning those of us on the side of the sailors, if we win, the entire population of Japan will have a legal precedent to support them in suing TEPCO, the government of Japan, and anyone else they can sick their attorneys on. But if TEPCO wins, a different kind of legal precedent will be set. Think of it. The entire population of Japan will have no legal recourse in international law on the books to support them in seeking redress for the grievances done against their bodies, their lives, their health, their children, and their genetic future by Fukushima and its deadly radiation. This is Nuclear Spin Cycle at Full Tilt Boogie. 
as the industry tries yet again to whitewash the damage that they do so they don't have to take responsibility, meaning pay for it, we the people risk losing the thread of continuity in the radiation argument, which will lead to everyone becoming confused and then being willing to follow the lead of the experts. Experts like the U.S. military report that just came out. And you heard the response today on Nuclear Hot Seat to this report. Or the UNSCIR reports from the United Nations, which was trounced so thoroughly last week by Dr. Alex Rosen of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. These reports downplay and minimize any impact by Fukushima's radiation on health. Without casting specific aspersions, I've got to say that the timing of these two reports strike me as being, shall we say, a bit dodgy. These could be interpreted as internationally scaled attempts to squash these sailors whose only fault was that they wanted to serve our country and provide humanitarian aid to our ally, Japan. But the nuclear industry needs to protect its billions of dollars in cash flow. To hell with six sailors. They've got leaks to plug. Not the leaks at Fukushima, with its popsicle slushy fence and still molten core, but the risk of the truth leaking out about what radiation exposure does and is doing to human bodies. The Operation Tomodachi lawsuit is not an isolated case. It will decide much about our shared future on this planet. Looking at it this way, again I state, this suit may be the most important legal event since the Nuremberg trials. Judgment in San Diego, coming to a federal courthouse on August 19. So if you want to know what to do, listen again to Steve Simmons in this week's interview and contact media politicians, and any billionaires you might know who would want to bankroll this. Send them all a link to this show. And to cover the Unscare Report, send them a link to last week's number 161 with Dr. Alex Rosen. And number 159, which was Steve Simmons' original interview. So devastating in its depth and emotionality and personal truth. On our side, we have little time, little money, But if you know social media, please help get this information out. I submit and I honestly believe that there is still time for our Davids and Davidas to once again defeat the nuclear Goliath. And on behalf of Nuclear Hot Seat, I will keep you posted. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, July 29, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, our friend Iori Mochizuki and his blog, Fukushima Diary, rocketnews24.com, Tokyo Shimbun, fukuleaks.org, the city of Fukushima, The Guardian, The Australian, Fox News, Seattle Times, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, The Arctic Sounder, CBS LA, KEZI TV, San Diego Union Tribune, NPR.org, The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, World Nuclear News, and the ever-vigilant Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. To access older episodes, we've got 161 of them on file. Our archive is available on iTunes, where you can subscribe under podcasts, or in the newly searchable website, NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Heartistry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. You have permission to reuse this material as long as proper attribution is included, meaning my name, the website, and email. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. 